Hello and welcome to the Bigger Picture Podcast. My guest today is Brian Kaplan, a professor of economics and an avid author on the culture wars. Brian wrote a book called Don't Be a Feminist, A Letter to My Daughter, and we spoke about all of the problems with modern feminism today. We also spoke about his latest appearance on Louise Perry's podcast and some of the disagreements they had there. And I did my best to defend Louise and her book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, because I think the critiques that she makes there about the extremely liberal sexual culture we find ourselves in is an important one. And we spoke a little bit about dating and how men can overcome their social anxiety when it comes to dating. And lastly, we spoke about Brian's latest book coming out soon called you Will Not Stampede Me, Essays and Nonconformism. And we got into a little bit of a debate about nationalism. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments about feminism, modern dating today, and nationalism. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy. So you wrote a piece called Don't Be a Feminist, a letter to my daughter, which I have to say was a very clever way of positioning the piece because I think it really reminds the reader that you're speaking as a father who cares for his daughter, you know, first and foremost. So you're not- I do, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's very important. So you're not an angry, toxic male here, you know, bashing all feminists. I think so. (laughs) I don't think so either. I've heard a few of your interviews and, you know, I've read the piece and really resonated with me. I think you made a lot of good points. So to start off, can you give us the definition of feminism as, you know, the average person thinks of it today? Mm -hmm. Right. Great question. Here, a lot of people say, well, Brian, what is your definition? And I say, I don't want to make up a definition. I want to find out how people actually use the word. Uh, So in the piece, I go over a lot of public opinion pieces and just find out what makes people think they're feminists, what they associate with it. And I think really the best definition in terms of how people actually use the word is that feminism is the view that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. You really just see very few people who identify as feminists who think that women are getting fair or better than fair treatment. On the other hand, out of people who say they're not feminists – at most, or the worst thing they'll say is, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. So maybe maybe men get treated more fairly, maybe they don't, or they just deny it. So I'd say that really is the key dividing line between feminists and non-feminists is whether you think that our society generally treats men more fairly than women. Right. And what are some of the main arguments that feminists make uh, to prove that society is unfair to women? Yeah, again, very good question. So I think most feminists will just say, no, that's not the right definition. The right definition is feminism is just the view that men and women should be equal. But then it turns out that almost everyone who says they're not a feminist agrees with that. So it really is sort of like saying feminism is a view that the sky is blue. It's like, all right, well, let's find the deniers of the sky is blue theory. And like, we can't find them. So I guess we're all feminists, which makes it kind of a moot point. Uh, what's striking to me is that I've had a bunch of arguments with feminists where they first say, your definition is terrible, wrong, pig-headed, just completely unfair. And then, furthermore, here's 20 different ways that our society treats men more fairly than women. It's like, right. it, it's just hard to understand how you can keep disagreeing when all of your evidence in favor of you, your view is precisely that you think that there are these gaps in fairness. In terms of what the main ones are, Uh, Probably still the biggest one is just that the labor market treats men better than women, especially given the same behavior. That's a key part of fairness. If one person has a job and the other one doesn't, and the person who has the job wants it and the person who doesn't have the job doesn't want it, and then you say, well, uh, the person who doesn't have a job was treated unfairly, it's like, well, they made a choice. They didn't want to be in the labor force. seems hard to say that that's unfair treatment. Uh, So anyway, that's probably still the biggest one. As an economist, we have a lot to say about differences in labor market outcomes for men versus women. Then you've got a lot that relate to the dating and marriage market. Ideas like women get almost all the housework shoved onto them, and that's unfair. And then there's plenty of others. Uh, In the essay, I try to say, well, 
what would be the best evidence of society treating men more fairly than women? And there, you know, my answer is, I think you really have to go to India and China and just look at the higher rates of female infanticide. And I think that would be a really great example. So per the definition, you know, our society is a little bit vague, whether our society is all of humanity or it's the US or it's the West. Uh, so there, at least I'll say that if, you, if, I, if I were in India or China, then I would say that would seem like there's at least a very strong case for being a feminist there because of these differences in infanticide. There's some dispute there about how much of it is selective abortion versus actual infanticide. And then to answer it, you've got to actually come up with a view on pro-choice versus pro-life, which I honestly just wanted to avoid. I said the essay is controversial enough. I don't also need to answer that question. Right. That is a, that is a difficult topic because usually people are uh, very much entrenched in either camp. And it's a, it's a Right. At the same time, suppose that there's a society where they just aborted all female fetuses. It's like it would seem kind of anti-feminist. <laughs> it's like, well, they're not. You say they're not people yet. Like they're going to be people, and they're trying to get rid of all the women. That seems doesn't at least doesn't give you pause. But I, mean, bit, I just didn't address bit. it because it was so hard. So you made a few very interesting points there that I want to develop. Mm -hmm. I heard on a different interview that you did. The interviewer mentioned that a friend of hers read your uh, piece and that you didn't define fairness. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, that is a fair point here. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, I'm not, you know, into uh, endlessly defining mm -hmm. terms in the Wittgenstein kind of manner, but sure. I do think, <laughs> you know, but I do think that in um, when we're dealing with psychology and uh, social mm -hmm. phenomena, it's really important to define our operational definitions. And I think this point about how we perceive fairness and how we perceive equality is very different when you're talking to people on the left and on the right. And mm -hmm. as I'm sure you know, uh, Tom Sowell, uh, and who, mm -hmm. for whomever isn't uh, familiar with him, he's a great economist from the Hoover Institution uh, at Stanford University. And one of his masterpieces, in my opinion, is his book, The Conflict of Visions, where he mm -hmm. talks about the constrained and the unconstrained visions, which are basically these um, underlying fundamental axioms that are at the base of the left and the right, you know, roughly mm -hmm. speaking. But the main differences here are that in the constrained vision, equality is equality of opportunity, right? They Think of systems and processes and how can we create a process that offers equality and for people, you know, to do with it what they can. But there is this underlying uh, assumption that human nature and society is imperfectible. There are certain fixed givens that we need to work around and find the optimal trade-offs. And on the unconstrained side, you know, human nature is infinitely malleable and we can perfect society. And so we need to shoot for equality of outcome, which you mentioned uh, in your piece, right? If outcomes aren't mm -hmm. equal, then society is unfair. So what do you think about that mm -hmm. kind of miscommunication here around mm -hmm. fairness? Yeah, great. I'm a huge Tom Soul fan myself, although I actually think that's his worst book. <laughs> so really? 25 years ago, I wrote <laughs> not one, but I wrote two essays against it because there were a couple of essay contests. Um, in any case, uh, defining fairness. I mean, here actually what I'll say is I don't think there is that big of a difference on the view of what counts as fair. I think if you just go and hear an argument about, for example, our labor outcomes fair, I really think that regardless of whether you are left wing or right wing, it comes down to, well, are you getting the same kind of pay for the same kind of work? Something like that. Um, it is true that if you are very left wing, then you might, after conceding, find men and women who are doing the same job at the same money. Uh, but if you're very left wing, you might then move the goalposts and say, well, but in, until we live in a society where every girl is strongly told that she has the absolute right to do exactly the same stuff as a boy, then it could still be unfair in that sense. We don't get equal encouragement. But normally that is something that's only tacked on at the very end after all the facts are against you. I see that more as a desperate last minute effort to go and salvage the position rather than what people are generally thinking of. Normally, if you want to go and argue that 
women are being treated less fairly than men, you will go to the canonical cases and you'll just say, look, here's a job. They both work in the bank. The woman actually worked more hours, got higher reviews, but it was the man that got the promotion. So that's totally unfair. Uh, so I think that's really what's going on. I think there, there is an, uh, an idea of, say, much bigger disagreement about what would count as fair than what really exists. Um, I mean, it's true that there is some background idea of equality of result versus equality of opportunity, but I think actually it is quite hard to find people that are actually really using equality of result as their normal method of evaluation. Uh, instead, instead, of, you know, so I think that you know, people usually actually start with equality of opportunity, and then if you really hammer them down and show <laughs> them, well, it isn't actually a difference, then they might retreat to the other one, but. It's not really what people have in mind when they're arguing about this stuff, in my view. So I'll give you an example where I mm -hmm. really do hear uh, this mm -hmm. equality of outcome narrative. Sure. When feminists say that there aren't enough women uh, CEOs, there aren't enough mm -hmm. women in STEM. And I think that, you know, there aren't enough women in positions of power. Mm -hmm. This is very much an equality of outcome uh, narrative, right? If we don't have, you know, even distribution mm -hmm. of men and women, then society is unfair, society is unequal. And I think that this uh, doesn't take into account these fixed givens of human nature, the fact that there are differences between men and women and their interests and their mm -hmm. uh, interest in uh, working over time and how much they want to spend uh, with how much time they want to spend with their kids. Not saying that fathers don't, but mm -hmm. you know, when you're pregnant and mm -hmm. you're taking care of infants, there's, there's a different uh, mm -hmm. priority. Uh, so I think that is one of the places mm -hmm. where I hear equality of outcome mm -hmm. really hammered <laughs> into us. What do you think about that? Yeah, great question. So in the case of STEM, obviously, whether you were when you're deciding whether or not to study STEM, you're usually young and would very rarely have any kids or be married or anything like that. Uh, when I actually read stuff about women in STEM, I think essentially what they're doing is, yes, they are talking about the unequal outcome, but really implicitly there's, and how did we get this unequal outcome? Hmm. Are you saying that women aren't good, aren't as good as men at STEM? Are you saying women aren't as good at math? So they're like, no, no. Okay, well then explain it. Explain it. All right. And that's, uh, is I think what's going on is they are pointing to the inequality of outcome in order to prove an inequality of opportunity. Uh, now, underlying this, there is a lot of intimidation where they're going to get mad at you if you start making the obvious replies of, well, I don't know, maybe women are worse at STEM. Uh, or, I mean, but even if you were to say, well, I just think that women don't like STEM. It's like, oh, women don't like STEM. Why is that? Is it because they're not you're saying that women aren't good at STEM? Like, are you saying that women's brains are not, see, like, so there is implicitly while you might sound, while it sounds like it's a complaint about inequality of outcome, I think it really does come back to a story about inequality of opportunity. And when you get more details, it'll often be things like, oh, well, women are made to feel uncomfortable in STEM because men will persist with their immature sexist humor, for example. Uh, at my son's university over in the STEM department, they actually had this diagram of an iceberg of all the ways that women are mistreated in STEM. And oh, wow. then at the top were things like someone actually saying women are not good at STEM, but then that's only above the waterline and below it's things like jokes and just negative attitudes about women. And so there is, if you just look at this official propaganda diagram, uh, there really is a strong claim that there's just so many kinds of unfair treatment and that women don't really have uh, equality of opportunity. So I right. think that is uh, so. I think it is just very hard to find someone who will just purely say, "No, no, women are treated absolutely perfectly fine. There's no difference. They have no valid complaint." But I don't care about that. All I care about is the numbers, which got to be fifty-fifty in electrical engineering. That person, like, the, like I occasionally will meet a person like that. Normally, they're actually professional philosophers. They have some further intellectual scaffolding that allows them to go and take the normal position and throw away all the normal supports and their position is still stable because they have trained themselves yeah. to keep the conclusion regardless of the arguments. 
And, you know, this, in a sense, it's a compliment. It's a sign that you're very smart. That you can get rid of all the normal intellectual supports and come up with something else. But to talk to any normal person who's worried about women in STEM, I think it almost always comes down to a lot of complaints about how women are being mistreated by men. Um, now, let's see. And then the case of things like few, fewer female CEOs because they've got to go and deal with this burden of pregnancy. Uh, that's one where it's like, okay, so what's unfair about that? And it's like, well, it should be just as easy for a female CEO to get a supportive male partner as it is for a male CEO to get a supportive female partner, right? And that's, again, one where it's like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, I can sort of see the point, but then I would say, look, well, there's this empirical question of do female CEOs want to marry house husbands? Right. Are they attracted to the kind of guy that would just be a house husband? Hypergamy says otherwise. Yes. So, Ian, that's the issue of is the problem just that our society is so sexist that men would just say, like, I couldn't possibly be a house husband? Or is it rather female CEOs themselves say, like, the guy that would be a house husband is not a guy that is suitable for a woman of my incredible awesomeness? <laughs> right? And that's where I would say, look, if it's the first story, then maybe you got a point. But like, are men really so stubborn and, and, and uniform in their refusal to assume this role, right? Or is it rather that the kind of woman that gets to that level of success would just consider that she's got to have a really awesome guy to be the father of her kids? In which case, yeah, it, doesn't, it seems kind of uh, unreasonable to say they can't find a house husband if there's all kinds of guys that are available and are willing to say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Sure, why not? Right. I think that, you know, you're making a really good point that a lot is attributed to systemic prejudice, mm -hmm. right? That really, if you look under the surface, a lot of it is just human nature. For instance, mm -hmm. there are, uh, women have a harder time uh, finding a supportive husband, women who are in, you know, high status roles, because hypergamy says that mm -hmm. women usually tend to mate, you know, across and uh, up dominance hierarchies. Right. Although it even says, well, it's not even true that women have a harder time finding the person. It's that the person that they claim to be, that they claim to want isn't the person they want. Exactly. Or, or, exactly. You know, more often it's the person <laughs> that outsiders assume that the female CEO would want. <laughs> like like right. talk to the female CEO themselves and say, look, I've got 10 available house husbands. Take your pick. It's like, I don't want those losers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think another point that you made was about this uh, iceberg, right? And the mm -hmm. the kind of teasing, the joking, the the jokes about women in STEM. And, you know, if anyone has ever been bullied, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's never fun. But I think that uh, more often than not, women have a hard time kind of interpreting how men mm -hmm. talk with one another. Mm -hmm. Men tease each other. You know, when you uh, mm -hmm. enter a new group, you're kind of poked and prodded and like mm -hmm. to, to see if you can handle it. You know, can you be one of the group? Can you Mm -hmm. uh, can you be part of the team? And women don't, women who didn't grow up with brothers, women who didn't uh, ah. grow up, <laughs> you know, playing with boys, they don't know that the teasing is, uh, you know, it's in good spirit most often. Uh, so I think that's mm -hmm. another source of this kind of hysteria. Right. I mean, especially if you just go back to my proposed definition. So my proposed definition was not feminism is the view that women are treated unfairly sometimes. Which case, again, it would be like the sky is blue. Of course, women are treated unfairly sometimes because they're humans and all humans are treated unfairly sometimes. It's just an inevitable part, almost inevitable of being around other people is that everyone will not treat you perfectly. That's why I said it's got to be the view that women are treated more unfairly than men. Uh, I think that you know, partly what you're saying is right, and it's just that women see men being jerks to each other and then they think that so you know, if they're if they're if they're a jerk to me too then that then that's a, some that, that's targeted at me personally but you know I think another part you know, so part of it is like as long as women actually see while well, men are being jerks to each other and they're being a jerk to me too then I think it would be harder to get this misconception I think much of what's going on is that the very presence of one woman in a room of men leads them to improve their behavior not just towards the woman which is usually usually well, the one woman in a group of guys gets the very best treatment in the room actually <laughs> but it also means the guys are better to each other it's hard for women to understand just how bad guys are to each other when there are no women present and once you see that then it's like okay actually i'm getting especially good treatment from these guys that behave in this way that seems kind of appalling to me uh, 
again, of course, there, you're right, there's a lot of other cues about how when men are mean to each other, it generally doesn't mean that they are, they really hate each other. It's just, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's horseplay. And then women misinterpret getting, you know, a one-tenth dose of the way that a, that a man treats another man as being they hate me rather than they are treating me kind of like an, another member of the group. So I think that's another part. But I think, I mean, just if women had an idea of what men were like when women aren't around, this would really change their views about how men are treating them. We can say, wow, I'm actually getting treated much better than any of these people do. So, I mean, in a sense, you could say it's complimentary. Um, right, again, it's right. the kind of thing where if you were determined to find unfairness, you could say, ah, they are singling me out for different treatment. Yeah, they're singling out for better treatment. Right. I don't think that uh, most, you know, women who identify as feminists, I I don't know if they've had healthy relationships with men. Oftentimes mm. they haven't. Uh, and mm. if you do grow up around boys, you know, you kind of learn uh, the, the language uh, mm -hmm. and you realize that boys and men, they operate a little differently and you're mm -hmm. able to Mm -hmm. uh, kind of filter their behavior mm -hmm. uh, in different terms, because it is true that women are uh, more easily offended um, mm -hmm. within, you know, female relationships. Oh, yes. Uh, female <laughs> <You friendships. noticed? laughs> um, So you have a daughter, so you, I'm sure uh, you yeah. observe this. Um, yeah, but I mean, I just like breaking up with your best friend. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so that does uh, happen. I, mean, does I, happen. I don't know of any actual <laughs> research on this, but I would just be stunned if women didn't have a higher rate of breaking up with best friends than men. They do. Uh, Joyce Benenson, are you familiar yeah. with her work? I don't think so. Um, she's brilliant. She studied mm -hmm. uh, preschoolers, uh, and you know she has this fantastic book called Warriors and Warriors. Like oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And so I, you know, I, mean, yeah. I talked to Robin Hanson about the book. Right, right, right. So – uh, she basically shows how the threshold for a friendship breakup is uh, mm -hmm. a lot lower um, yes. between girls. So I wanted you to. Mean, ask the flip side of this is that a lot of intrafemale bullying is understated, and men don't pick up on the understatement. So it's like you know, like you know, that's such a great dress, I could never wear it. Like you know, a man might say, "Oh, okay," like, but <laughs> another woman that could be the friendship ending insult. Uh, so you know that's that's another problem is that you know men may actually be getting some pushback from women and just not understand. You just got to like look in the eyes and say, "I am now insulting you. Are you aware of this?" Like, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. Women are more subtle, you know, when they're being antisocial. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It's always in a kind of veiled mm -hmm. insults and uh, mm -hmm. um, you know very much under the surface. Uh, so right. I mean, I think, you know, this brings me back to just a you know, general point that really doesn't have that much to do with men versus women, but just that you know, human beings are not mind readers, but you always know your own thoughts, which means that you know, like the idea that other people always know what they have done to hurt you, it's just false. And you can go and say like, mad, why am I mad? And it's like, they know why. Like, do they? Um, you right. know, like often there's pushback and say, it's only you autistic people that don't understand why people get <laughs> mad at you. It's like, no, it's not true. People are totally neurotypical or like are often just confused by each other. It's because they don't have telepathy. That's the fundamental problem of human relationships is this lack of telepathy. It's just not true that people have a really great understanding of what everybody is thinking all the time. That would be amazing if they did. Right, right. You know, um, Brene Brown talks about this and uh, she, she calls it, you know, the story that we we need to be careful about the stories we tell ourselves. You know, if someone gives us, um, you know, a, a mean look, what story are we then playing in our head? Maybe they just had a bad day. Maybe they got a yeah. bad text. You know, yes. maybe it doesn't have anything to do with us. Yes, so, yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, and my favorite <laughs> your little known concept in psychology is the spotlight effect. Just like, you know, simple, so, you know, like, like one, one sentence slogan, you know, we would worry a lot less about what other people thought about us if we realized how little they think about us at all. Everybody's focused on themselves and not really paying that much attention to other people. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you about this idea of gender norms. And mm -hmm. I've been doing quite a bit of research on this topic. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that surprises me is when I read, uh, you know, feminists and gender activists who talk about gender norms, you get the sense that they they feel that 
the norms themselves are inherently harmful. The existence mm-hmm. of such gender norms are harming their self-expression, their mental health, um, but because of society's expectations. And, you know, you talk about infanticide in China and how, you know, feminism would make sense if we were living uh, in that kind of world. And I would agree that if I were living in a world yeah, where- 1.4 billion do. Right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But, but we're, we don't live in that world, right? We live in a mm-hmm. world of equal opportunity in the Western world where women are absolutely free to live however much they want, to balance careers and family, whatever proportion suits them. They can have as many casual hookups or as little as they'd like. And yet there's this uh, under, you know, there's this kind of a fear mm-hmm. that we're being brainwashed uh, mm-hmm. to stay at home and be, you know, traditional 1950s housewives. Mm-hmm. And I liked your argument that if anything, we're brainwashed in the opposite direction these yeah. days. So tell us a little bit more about the brainwashing that's going on. Right. So canonical brainwashing is, you know, you will be a 1950s mother. You will stay at home. Right. That's what you'd actually get. In fact, in a 1950s movie about brainwashing, it would be like that. Uh, So what I say there is, well, let's just look at what explicit statements people are told. Right. So, I mean, of course, it does vary based upon what school you go to. But even in the 1980s, I can't think of a single time where I've heard, uh, heard, heard female students told, like, you know, like, you know, being a mother is the most important thing. You know, like, if you don't have kids, then your life is worthless. You know, like, like you know, make sure that you have a very small number of sexual partners, marry young. I don't remember any propaganda like that. I do remember a pile of propaganda about always use contraception. All, you know, and, like, really, like, always, not even always until you're ready to get pregnant. It's like, well, I mean, like, what about when I'm ready to get pregnant? Then do I break this always use contraception <laughs> thing? Oh, well, yeah. Well, I guess the way it goes without saying, like, well, you didn't say it. I mean, see, you might think that do use contraception when, when you don't want to get pregnant would also go without saying, but that was not the way that sex ed was taught. The whole system was centered around the horrors of getting pregnant combined with it's super important to do well in school so you can do well in college so you can get a high power job. I mean, this And this is the lesson for both men and women. No, I'm not going to say that there was any brainwashing about it is stupid to be a mother. Only idiots would have kids. If you have too many kids, then you're an even bigger idiot than that. I didn't hear any of that. But really, there's basically one-sided promotion of delaying childbirth, delaying motherhood, and doing and getting a really good job. And almost no consideration of maybe there's a trade-off. Maybe if you focus too much on your career, you'll end up not being able to have kids or you'll have a worse marriage. So I would say that while it wasn't the most extreme kind of brainwashing in favor of being a single childless career woman, nevertheless, it did lead that way. And I think it has gotten stronger over time uh, where there's almost no attention paid to there's a trade-off, and if you focus too much on your career, this is going to go and have possible costs in your personal life, and maybe you will not have kids, and did you consider that you might want that? Uh, I mean, probably the most extreme version of this brainwashing that I ever saw was about 20 years ago, there was new medical research that came out showing that it was even harder for women over 40 to conceive than previously thought. And the day that this, uh, this study came out, they immediately put on representatives from the National Organization of Women to rebut. Oh, wow. And like, and like well, what's the rebuttal? And the rebuttal is, women are already very well aware of this. There's no need to discuss it. It's like, the whole point of the study is that it's harder than previously realized, so it should actually change your mind. But nevertheless, the idea was they're entitled to go and rebut because otherwise someone might get this crazy idea that maybe they should go and adjust their life plans to deal with biological facts. And it's like, yeah, of course you should adjust your life plans to deal with biological facts. Like, what are you crazy? I mean, which by the way, does bring me to an argument that I did hear that uh, from multiple people actually that did surprise me. So I heard some people say, look, maybe it's the universe that's unfair to women. Oh, wow. And, I'm, so? and more than one person independently said, like, the universe is unfair. Who's the like, universe? Yeah, the, yeah, and it's like, like the universe just says that women face these trade offs that men don't face uh, because. You know, for women, they really have to say, well, if I want to have kids, I've got to get started fairly early during a time when that's going to go and have some notable career costs and men don't face that. And you know, my reaction to that is, all right, well, 
that is a cost the universe gives you. It's odd to go and attribute some kind of strange metaphysical agency to the universe. But even if you were, I'd say, well, here's the flip side is that women have the opportunity to go and have kids when they are ready, whereas men have to go and find someone that's on board with it. You might say, well, don't women have to find someone on board too? It's easier. It's definitely easier. You can even just go full sperm bank single mom, uh, whereas, uh, and then you actually get to have the child and raise it. Say men can try that too. Yeah, it's just not the same level of of of, of surety of success if you start young that women would have. So I'd say, like even there, there is you know there's some downsides of being with some women. There's some upsides of being a woman. Uh, of, of, of being of being women. So like, why be so negative in the evaluation? It's like not clear to me. I think this is such an important point because there is very much this narrative that I hear today that I think is almost lying to women and mm -hmm. making them forget the basic uh, givens of being a human female. You know, I don't know if it's the universe or if it's God or if it's just natural selection and you know, mm -hmm. this is how we were designed, but the fact is you do have a fertility window and it, it's much mm -hmm. easier to get pregnant, you know. Yes, but even it's like a total glass half, class half empty, half full kind of thing, right? Yeah, the, whether like, you want to interpret it positively or negative is up to you. That's, yeah. I think that, you know, in the feminist narrative, there's this, since the second wave, right, there was mm -hmm. this idea that independence and freedom is the highest mm -hmm. virtue. Mm -hmm. And women have this, um, first of all, this clock <laughs> that makes mm -hmm. them a little less able to, you know, be completely free and live uh, their lives, you know, in a com complete, you know, independent self-expression mm -hmm. for as long as mm -hmm. they want. You have to do some planning and you have to, uh, you know, find a relationship. Uh, assuming you want to build a family, you have to consider these things and maybe um, pure independence and freedom isn't mm -hmm. where you're going to derive the most satisfaction and the most fulfillment, but that narrative is really pushed. And this lie that you can easily get pregnant, you know, after age 35 or 40 is, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of women uh, find themselves in many courses of IVF and yeah, you know, sure. all sorts of things that are really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they're not successful. Sometimes they are. They're very pricey. Um, and yeah, not in Israel, right? You get free IVF in Israel. <laughs> that is do true. We do, we do get uh, free IVF. Um, that's a, a perk. That's definitely a perk. Um, among others, uh, uh, although the current uh, situation. Um, yeah. I mean, here I often think of the scene in Titanic when Rose's mother takes her side and says, we are women, Rose. Our choices are never easy. It's like, and then you look at them and you're like, I think you're doing a lot better than the, than the guys down in steerage. Like, what are, what exactly are their choices? Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, again, it is one where you can go and focus on the negative or you can focus on the positive or you can just, honestly, you can just try to have a balanced view of things and saying, well, here are a bunch of good things that we've got. Here's a bunch of bad things we have. How can we go and take the best advantage of it? I mean, in the case when I hear about women who are 40 who are doing multiple rounds of IVF, I mean, you know, I mean, my reaction there is, you know, like you have a teen pregnancy. And my thinking is, look, this could be the only time you ever get pregnant successfully. It's like, you know, like you might think this is the end of the world. Like maybe it's not. Maybe this is something where it's like, well, like I'm pregnant now. Like this, like this is going to work if we you know, like in this way, I know I'm not going to be childless if I go through with this, you know, like. It's one where people would say, like, what if your daughter in that situation? I'm like, it's complicated. It's not just it's like, obviously, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. It's like, yeah, I think a really bad thing to happen is to want kids and not be able to have kids. That sounds really bad to me. I absolutely agree. And, you know, I think that um, if you do take all of these things into account, you can, you, the, the years of having kids, you know, especially young infants, mm -hmm. uh, you do have to be around them more often, you know, and you do get more freedom as they uh, grow up a bit. And you can uh, organize your own education, your own higher education and your own career around that. Um, and have in establishing a family, you know, I think that doing that early on doesn't mean, uh, you know, you're going to be poor or uneducated or mm -hmm 
not have any career. And I think that narrative mm -hmm. uh, is still haunting us. You know, that was definitely the that like teen pregnancy scare in the '90s. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know that that was a big theme. You know, in sitcoms and uh, you know the like the world ended. Uh, and you know, granted, it's a uh, it's 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 complex situation, uh, but I think that demonizing mm -hmm. children is very problematic. And I love mm -hmm. that you are very pro having children and, you know, you give mm -hmm. a good uh, name for having children and also to fatherhood, because I think mm -hmm. that today also in the feminist narrative, we, um, we hear that, you know, fathers are nice to have, but mm -hmm. not necessary. Right. So what do you think about the role of fatherhood and how, mm -hmm. How do you think about having children and, uh, you know, the fulfillment that comes with them? Right. So I have a book called Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids that talks a lot about how we overrate the role of upbringing and underrate the role of genetics in adult outcomes. One of the actual results in this research is that the long run effects of having a dad are a lot less than people think. There are There's a famous study where you go, we'll go and compare kids where their parents were never married to ones where the father just died accidentally. And the kids where the father just died accidentally had outcomes that were basically normal, uh, as if they'd had two parents, whereas the ones where their parents had never married, as usual, did a lot worse. And the usual interpretation there is if the father died accidentally, then basically he had normal genes and his kids got normal personality genes. Whereas when the parents never married, then you're probably getting more impulsive more impulsive personality genes, which then leads to worse performance in life. Uh, this is a hard story for people to accept. And yet, knowing all this, I still play, have in my queue a piece on how fatherhood is underrated. And the reason I say is, look, all this is focusing on your adult outcomes, but guess what? There's 20 years when you're not an adult. And during that time, it's really great to have a dad, You know, not only for financial reasons, but just to have your buddy and someone who cares about you and does stuff with you. I mean, that to me is a huge deal. There's something in social science actually where we have this long run bias where we think, well, all that matters is how things turn out ultimately. It's like, no, actually everything matters. And if it's if you have a short run of 20 years, then to go and say, well, who cares about that? It's like, no, you should care a lot about that. It really matters, especially since that's the time when you actually will have the closest relationship with your parents in almost all likelihood. So yeah, I think that it really matters a lot. Uh, now, by the way, here I, I recently wrote two of my most popular pieces of dating advice. So I wrote one okay. for men called She's the One and one for women called He's the One. Um, since we're on the topic of women and parenthood and fatherhood, I mean, a lot of what I say to women is you've got a wide range of options here. And you've just, and like, of course, you can't have any guy that you want. But what's true is that if you are flexible on a few things, you can get a lot of, de of detailed outcomes that you really want and other margins. You know, like, for example, if you want to get a really reliable father for your kids. So, yeah, like if you're just willing to go and marry a guy five or 10 years older, that gets way easier. If you're willing to be flexible on that one dial. Right? And, you know, and why? It's like, well, you marry a young guy. It's like, well, I hope he matures. You marry a guy five or 10 years older, like, I've seen that he has matured. You're no, it, it's, it's just not the same gamble, right? And you could say, but, but I want to get everything. It's like, well, yeah, I can't give you that. One thing that social science really shows is that in terms of the number of kids that you have, it seems female traits are much more important than male traits. Both men and women, it matters, but it looks like men are just a lot more flexible on what they're willing to do with kids. So, like if you want to go and have one kid, you want to have three kids, this actually doesn't constrain your choice of husband that much because men are just flexible on this kind of thing. Uh, so if you are a woman who knows what you want, I mean, I say like, I mean, honestly, I say, you know, a lot of what is a good idea is just to be, you know, don't say this, you know, like the very first date, but like by the fifth date to say like, this is, this is what I'm looking for. I like number of kids and, you know, it's good way of weeding out all the things. Often you'll find out the guy's like, yeah, if I like you, then like, I like your plan. I like that. I like that. I wanted to ask, do you get some pushback on the age gap? Do women Let's want see. to date men who are their age? Because my husband mm -hmm. is seven years older than me. And ah. 
I, I prefer it that way. I completely agree. You want mm-hmm. someone who's, uh, you know, matured, who's, uh, mm-hmm. who's gone through enough life to, to be ready for, mm-hmm. uh, for marriage, for children. Right. So the usual view among social scientists is that women find men their own age or maybe one or two years older to be maximally attractive. And definitely one thing is that has evolved over the last 30 years is just a disgust norm against significantly larger age gaps. Even seven years in the U.S., there are people who behind your back will be making gagging. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like there's people just like, oh, it's – I mean, so I recently was teaching some very advanced high school students at a summer school, and the, there there was a couple that came and spoke where they had a large age gap, and they were just spontaneously saying, "Can you believe that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I can believe it. Like, what's the big <laughs> deal?" Like, I say, I "Thought you guys are so tolerant about everything else in the universe. Why not that?" Like, but that's a power dynamic, and I was like, "Well, maybe some people like that," and they're like. <laughs> and like, look, if you're willing to admit that people can like everything else in the sun, why not something that a lot of people have liked for thousands of years? Yeah, I've heard that, you know, the the usual, the average age gap is around five years. Uh, in that, of- that's actually, at least in the U.S., that's quite a bit too high. Really? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that I think I think the average is maybe th- real. So the median, the median, it might be right about the average because the average includes some you know, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio who marries. <laughs> but but so you know, for you median, I think for median, I think it is only about two or three years in the U.S. Interesting. Interesting. So I wanted to ask you as well. Uh, I heard your conversation with Louise Perry, uh, which mm-hmm. was very interesting. And I really loved her book. Um, and I really the case against her. the sexual revolution. Yes, the case against the sexual revolution. And, um, you know, I think she's a very sophisticated thinker. And she made r- a lot of really good and important points about the darker uh, elements of the liberal uh, sexual culture that we find ourselves in. And you did bring up a few points mm-hmm. that I, I felt like you guys uh, didn't get the chance to fully develop, mm-hmm. which I would love to re-explore. All right, uh, let's re-explore. So one of them was that this generation is having less sex, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, yes. you brought this up that the general trend is uh, towards a very asexual kind of culture. Mm-hmm. And you know, reading her book, I, I think you were kind of surprised because these two things don't really go together. And what well, I she has this kind of stuff on hookup culture and how rampant it is. Although you know, she does occasionally say, "Oh, and also people are having less sex," but it's like, well, so, <laughs> so I want to I want to kind of bridge both of your opinions because I think you're both right, and I think you're just talking about different generations. I think All you right. know she is um, like myself, a millennial, and. We grew up in a very liberal, sex positive culture. You know that was kind of like the um, the after after effect of the whole sexual revolution and the mm-hmm. second wave of feminism. And our culture was very hypersexualized, and casual hookups were um, you know considered kind of a rite of passage and something. And this, we were bombarded by this, you know, in, in media and magazines and all sorts of um, kind of, you know, the, the ideas that were circulating and, um, you know, body count and things like that. Mm-hmm. This, this was the culture you were in. And I think that in today's uh, young generation, the Gen Zers, mm-hmm. they have grown up with social media, they haven't had enough face-to-face interactions, you know, to be able to flirt and to court and to, to even, you know, get to a point where they're having a hookup or a, a date or, you know, a relationship. So we're seeing, and uh, not to mention, you know, they grew up in the hashtag me too uh, kind mm-hmm. of era and, you know, consent needs to be verbally given uh, so affirmative. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I think that, you know, growing up in this kind of environment really put them off to sex and this whole kind of um, gender fluid uh, exploration mm-hmm. as well. A lot of these people are asexual, right? Mm-hmm. Because of all of the puberty blockers and the hormones that they're on. A lot of them, are their whole libido is kind mm-hmm. of extinguished. So you have all of this. 
And you have a young generation that's having less sex. But I think Louise Perry, you know, what she's talking about is this maybe from 22, 25 to, you know, 30s uh, and early 40s, people who grew up in this very permissive, liberal uh, sexual culture, uh, they're not able uh, within that culture to really find a committed relationship because their Mm -hmm. strategies aren't, you know, uh, conducive to that kind of, uh, you know, finding a partner uh, who's willing to commit if you think you need to have sex on the first date. And I think these same people who are promoting these ideas, you know, they're in media now, they're writing Teen Vogue, you know, they're, they're still kind of pushing these ideas. So tell me, tell me what you think, where, what data are you aware of about the sexlessness of this generation? All right. So honestly, from memory, I think you know, there's there's a few sources like General Social Survey, but I think actually sex researchers use a couple of other ones. In any case, so unless I'm very mistaken, uh, I think that actually this uh, decline in actual rate of having sex has just been continuous over the last 30 years or so. I don't think that we had a big increase followed by a decrease. Uh, but in any case, if you read Louise's book, she seems prim- primarily focused on uh, young women today being part of a hookup culture. It's not like I'm speaking for my generation and now I know young women today don't. Rather, she like most of the book is about how young women today are making these terrible choices. And furthermore, this is one thing that I thought was quite striking is she says what really makes her feel like she's doing her job and that her book is making a difference is when she meets young women who say, I'm not having sex early on anymore. And then she's like, yes. My (laughs) reply to that is, look, I'd be happy if someone said, your writings help me find true love. I wouldn't be happy because someone just stopped doing something. I want something good to happen, not just avoiding bad things. That's probably part of me is I just just want great things to happen for people. So, I mean, I want someone to say everything's working out for me, not I'm just not making really bad choices. Uh, Now, I think really what's going on is this. What she's talking about exists, but it's not a hookup culture. It's a hookup subculture. Okay. It is a certain narrow fraction of people are doing this, and they hang out with all these other people that are doing it, and they imagine that's the world. Because guess what? Lonely people don't talk a lot about being lonely, and especially because they are lonely, they don't even have people to talk about it with. That's Those are the people that we pick up with nationally representative surveys as we find the lonely people. Otherwise, they're, they are just not to be seen. If you go to the nightclub and look around and say, where are the lonely people? Yeah, probably the lonely people are at home. And then everyone you talk to is like, oh, yeah, hookups are everywhere. It's like, well, they're everywhere here because you're in the place where they happen. But this is not, many people have never been to a place like this. And like, who are these losers? Yeah, like 70% of the population would never even consider going to a place like this. Now, here is something that I do know. If you look at the data from the general survey, so this is only the U.S., but I think it actually is capturing something quite normal for humans. Uh, and this is that the, the modal number of lifetime sexual partners for both men and women is one. Right Now, it's important to remember what the mode means. Uh, remember, the mode of a distribution is the single most common answer. So it doesn't mean that most people only have one partner. It doesn't mean that that's the average. The average is way higher. But you just take a look at the distribution, you'll see, right, you know, zero is uncommon. One is the most common. And then it you know, like goes down to, I think two is more common than zero. But anyway, there's just a huge group of people in the population who have exactly one per lifetime. Right now, people like Louise Perry, I like, or like, of course, people that have a lot, they're like, that's total lies. People, you know, and it's like, well, look, we do, like, there is reason to think that women are understating, but we also have a lot of evidence that men overstate. But the mode is one for both. So maybe women are having more than what they're saying, men are having less than what they're saying, but still, you look at that and like, gee, what's going on? And I think the best way of interpreting that is, most humans have severe social anxiety. Their fear of rejection is immense. Uh, which again, if you are around guys when it's just guys, it's like, yeah, like, like go and talk to that girl. Like, I'm not doing it. I couldn't possibly. It's like, what's the worst that could happen? 
oh, so, right? This is actual human nature. And the, and the idea is, well, this is only in our culture that people are afraid to approach a stranger and say hello. That's not only in our culture. That's all cultures. That's human nature. And as to why there's even any plausibility to Louise's story about this incredible hookup culture promiscuity, here's the real story. There's like 5 to 10% of men who really are extremely outgoing. And if you want to be negative about them, they're sexual predators. If you want to be positive about them, they're just guys with a lot of confidence. And guess what? Those guys are met by women all the time because they keep introducing themselves. They keep popping up and saying, hi there, which then I think really does lead women to think that they are typical guys. I think it's one where if you sit back and thought about it, could the guys that are coming up to me a lot be typical? It's like, they can't be typical. They're actually quite unusual. Right, but right. nevertheless, they punch so much above their weight in terms of forming women's views of what men are like that it leads to just a tremendous mis, you know, you know, misunderstanding of what most men are like, which then, then does play into my advice for women. It's like, look, you can go and get a guy that is way better than the ones that are coming up to you if you're just willing to go and make the first move. Right? And again, this is one where, say, like a, another big difference between humans is as terrified as men are of making a first move, women are even more terrified. There is a common answer of, oh, no, 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 women can make their wishes known, they drop their handkerchief or whatever. And it's like, yeah, but remember, people are terrible at interpreting this stuff. You've got to be more direct. And there is a very large payoff, I claim, to women of being more direct. Um, again, this is one where people parody, you know, parody what I'm saying or caricature and saying, oh, so women should just go up to a guy they like and say, hey, want to hook up? Like, no, that's not a good way to, uh, f- to find a long, the long-run relationship that you want. You know, I suggest, look, if you're tongue-tied, how about just go up to a guy you like and just say, you seem promising. <laughs> right? <laughs> that would get his interest. Yes, that will get his interest. Same time, like, it's not that forward. It's just like, me? I seem promising to someone? Oh, my God. Like, oh, like if you just want to make a guy fall in love with you, I don't know of many better sentences to try than that one. It's like, I have been singled out as being in some way pleasing to a woman I haven't talked to before. Like, how did the first, like, how did this happen? How can I have this incredible good fortune? Right. But I mean, I feel like, again, you might say, well, that could be misinterpreted. Yeah. If you go up to a really outgoing nor- uh, guy that uh, that's just picking up women at bars probably would be, Go to like a normal guy who is terrified to talk to you. Like suddenly, I think this is a guy that can get up his courage because of like, the, like, like he, like he may even go to his friends. He's like, she said, I'm really promising, and I think the normal <laughs> reaction of other guys is like, oh my god, like, and in my entire life, I've never not only is it, I've never heard this, I've never heard of any guy who has heard this. This is some incredible opportunity. He's like, well, what do I do? Like, well, don't mess it up. Amazing. You know, you made a few points there that I want to touch upon. The the last one about just approaching the guy. I I really agree with this. And I think that the general attitude uh, should be, you know, when women go on a date, that he's more afraid of you than you are of him. If he's a good one, you know, if he isn't a predator, uh, narcissistic, and, you know, uh, is having way too many hookups to even care. Mm -hmm. If he's an actually genuinely good guy, he's going to be more terrified of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the social anxiety is going to be high. So, you know, being positive, uh, you know, being mm-hmm. um, welcoming, you know, that doesn't mean mm-hmm. that you jump into bed on the first date, but you know, <laughs> being, being interested in him and, you know, being, mm-hmm. um, you know, showing interest, uh, being um, warm and, you know, mm-hmm. wholeheartedly listening and, you know, appreciating the things that you're hearing if if he's, you know, of interest to you, I think that goes a long way. And I yeah, think that course. women forget in our culture how much power we do have, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to to really make a guy feel good about himself, especially a good guy, especially a guy mm-hmm. who just wants to, you know, uh, do his best and, you know, be a good man and and find a long-term relationship. So I think these men obviously do exist. And not everyone is a sexual predator, mm-hmm. heaven forbid. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't subscribe to that uh, worldview at all. But I do think, you know, what you were saying about the subculture 
is is an interesting point because it, it might be the case that you know a more left leaning you know high socioeconomic status kind of a world, uh, especially that you see in uh, undergraduate degrees and universities today. You know that kind of world, the hookup culture does mm-hmm. exist there, and I think mm-hmm. that w- when uh, women yeah, come it's up- just everywhere, but so like as to. You know, what percentage it is? It's just you. If you are at a nightclub or something like that, it just gives you a totally <laughs> conf- a wrong view of what is going on on Earth. So just think about all the people home alone that night. <laughs> they vastly outnumber the people in the granted, club. Granted, granted, but just in defense of uh, Louise Perry, I think she's talking uh, to her niche, and her niche is responding. So there are mm-hmm. these are there are yeah. these hopeless souls that you know uh, have been sold. The- you know, the, the tale that they need to hypersexualize themselves. You know, I see mm-hmm. sometimes women, uh, young women, how, how they dress when they're going out uh, on a date or going out with friends or, you know, their dating profiles and it's hypersexualized. And mm-hmm. that's not what men are looking for when they're looking for mm-hmm. a long-term partner. Yes. And I think when women tell uh, Louise that, you know, we, <laughs> I, I realize that I don't need to sleep with a guy on the first date. They have, taken the first step that is necessary to actually find a long-term partner. Because when you realize that you don't need to engage in this culture, you can finally engage in the culture mm-hmm. that you're talking about of, you know, normal people who spend most nights at home, not going to a nightclub and are looking for genuine connection. And I think, I think that is the kind of, uh, you know, sigh of relief uh, <laughs> that she's experiencing when, uh, when she's hearing about uh, these girls uh, because mm-hmm. it is it is a toxic mm-hmm. culture for who whoever's in it. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> I mean, still yeah. what I would say, like, I think your advice is a lot better than hers. I don't think there's any I – mean, I could misremember, but I don't think there's anything in, in her book about being warm and being interested in a guy. And these are things where you are raising your market value. And particularly, you're raising your market value with someone who is interested in a long-term relationship. So this is what I say, like, you know, this is what a constructive person does is like, I want to be valued. I want to go and show that I, that someone would want to be with me. And, but in particular, I want to go and show things that are good about me that would be good primarily in the long run. I think you know, possibly what's going on with this hookup culture is that if you combine a feminist ideology, which makes you think poorly of men and hostile, well, at that point, if you do have a bad attitude, then the only guys that will hang out with you are ones that are looking for short run sex. It's like, well, I'll put up with her terrible attitude in order to go and have sex with her. Right. That's you know, a good so point. like there, there is, I think there, there is, this is what economists call adverse selection, where if you have a bad personality, then why is somebody with you? Well, for some reason other than your personality. Right. And again, you, know, you say, well, feminists don't have bad personalities. I think a good way of thinking about what feminism and standardly results in is that it is a philosophical rationalization of having a bad personality. Of antipathy, like, as you call yes, it. Yes, yeah, of antipathy and self-pity, which are you know, traits that a man might put up with if he thinks that you are beautiful, but these are not traits that a man wants to have for the rest of his life around him. It's like, it's, I mean, obviously, like, uh, you know, like what I often say is, look, you know, you know, relationships are hard enough already without someone having the philosophy that you are a bad person or that your group is bad or that Absolutely. your group is the oppressor group. Absolutely. They're, they're, it's hard work <laughs> to begin with, so we don't need mm-hmm. anything uh, mm-hmm. adding to that for sure. I think you know the point that you made, you kind of made this aside comment uh, to your daughter that uh, you know this idea of superficial beauty and uh, – uh, and that kind of narrative need not concern her because she has outer beauty and inner beauty. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of an aside comment at the end of that uh, section. But I think uh, you really hit the nail on the mm-hmm. head there because it is both of those things, you know, that mm-hmm. really attract someone when they're looking for a mm-hmm. long term partner. And this idea. Right, right. That- and like I say, in me, in my advice for both men and women is. Human beings, especially men, but women too, just put way too much emphasis on looks. Absolutely. Like, like, like this thought experiment. I've given this to guys when there's no women around. So this is just the honest report of what guys will say to each other. And I say, imagine that you're dating a supermodel with a terrible personality. How long does it take before you are miserable to be with her? And guys say, yeah, like like a month. It's like, <laughs> all right. 
So <laughs> what does that mean for your dating choices? I mean, I'm, like, honestly, I will tell guys, look, you know, like you might think that like I have to be with someone beautiful, but if you like if you are with a woman like who is like under thirty and she has a good personality, she'll just seem beautiful to you very quickly. If uh, like, like so, like, like you can just get over that. It's like you know, average is great. Actually, is <laughs> what I'm always tell, uh, you know, like tell young guys like it has to be really beautiful. Like yeah, look, they're almost all really beautiful. So just stop worrying about that so much and instead focus on someone that is highly likable. Right, like, oh wow. Well. I mean, so I mean, strikingly, so like, you know, a friend of my son's is always complaining about the women that he meets are like so superficial, and they're basically just saying, "I'll only go out with a guy that will spend at least five hundred dollars on a date." And then he's on Tinder, and I'll say, "Look, of course you're having this problem on Tinder. The whole point of the dating site is to go and get people like that together." But there's other dating sites that that are set up in a different way. And I've talked. I mean, I've been married for um, almost thirty years, so. I've not used them myself, but I have talked to other people. There is a wide range of dating websites. Some are designed for short run, some for long run. If you don't like what you're getting, then switch over to one that has more of a long run focus on personality. Duh. Absolutely. Absolutely. We met on Bumble. Um, thank ah, heaven. Because right. we wouldn't have had any other way of meeting. Really. Right, I actually met a guy, one of the main guys from Bumble and he was telling me about his, uh, his company. So, Yeah, yeah. It's a very nice idea. The fact that as you said, you know, the woman approaches, like the mm -hmm. woman uh, sends a message only if she's really interested. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the, a culture is really built around an mm -hmm. app uh, and it kind the way they uh, market themselves. So there's definitely better options mm -hmm. uh, than Tinder out there. Right. I've I also know. heard very good yeah. things about the league. I have uh, a friend who is super happy that he met his wife on the league. So I have some free that. advertising to a company that I heard is doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> they need to sponsor us here. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard of it. I'm uh, I've been out of the game, so, <laughs> so I'm sure there are um, you know new dating sites popping up. Uh, but I do want to shift gears and talk a little bit about your new book that's coming out soon, mm -hmm. uh, called "You Will Not Stampede Me," uh, which is a collection yes. of essays, mm -hmm. subtitled yeah. "Essays on Nonconformism." There you go. There you go. And I wanted to talk about one of the themes that really popped out. Uh, you know, as you said, nonconformism. I think that one of the important themes here was this not trusting blindly uh, of public opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Not making public opinion and the status quo our God and really uh, thinking critically um, and allowing ourselves to be independent uh, thinkers and not get swept away by mm -hmm. the mob or the herd or, you know, the, the things we hear on the news. So you, you give us a, a, a few um, situations where, you know, public opinion can really steer us in the wrong direction. So to start off, can you tell us where does this nonconformist kind of mentality come from for you? Hmm. Honestly, I'll say I can't remember a time that I wasn't a nonconformist <laughs> There's a lot of research on where personality comes from. Everyone who has an open mind says genetics has a big, though not decide, not absolute effect. So, I mean, I think that I'm just genetically a nonconformist. Um, but at the same time, I also am giving advice to people and saying, look, there's a lot of advantages in nonconformism that tend to be overlooked, especially – Think about this. Human beings evolved in small bands of 20 to 40 people where it really matters if people think that you're weird and it, what comes around goes around. And yet almost all of us are now in big anonymous societies where they just don't have the same kind of pressure. So I say there are many people who have desires that they want to go and exercise and dreams that are different or unusual, but they're so afraid of going against what is normal. And I say, look, like, it, there might be an issue, but just take a look and find out well, what would happen if I went and did what I wanted to do instead of what I'm supposed to do. I think earlier you were talking about these feelings that men and women have, but especially feminists about how there's these strong gender norms and I have to go and comply with them. Uh, of course, flipping that around, you can say there's strong feminist norms and I have to comply with those. And for all those people, I would say, well, do you really? What happens if you don't conform? 
and maybe you will be crushed and your life will be ruined. But normally, I think that if you keep your eyes open, you realize I can just get away with a lot of stuff because most people are not paying much attention to me. Um, and that's what I would recommend. So, yeah, of course, if you're in a society where you feel like there are these crushing norms and like, you know, I really want to be a doctor, but our society says women can't be, you know, can only be nurses, that feels bad. But then the question is, well, what happens if a woman tries to become a doctor? Like, right, there are some societies where that would just be illegal, but normally not. It's like, well, maybe what happens is it's just fine. And people say, oh, you want to be a doctor? Oh, my God. It's like, all right, well. Okay, so someone expressed some mild surprise, and then what? It's like, well, uh, you won't. It'll be you'll be more likely to marry another doctor. It's like, all right, that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> all right, and what else? And that you know, like you know, like well, your whole life, every now people will see you in medical clothes and think you might be a nurse. It's like, all right, well, can you live with that? All right, and like, yeah, it's not that bad, is it? Yeah, that's <laughs> the worst that can happen. I think yeah. you know you'd call it nonconformism. And I, I like to call it uh, on the flip side, authenticity. And I think this is- Yeah, uh, that's, that, that, that's a great word, actually. I like I, it. I think, I think it's um, an American affliction, um, if, I, if I might say so. Uh, you know, I grew up in America for 10 years, uh, but- So, I, so wait, which one, Americans are especially conformist or- Oh, 100%, 100%. <laughs> really? maybe, maybe Europeans, um, some, you know, you know British- uh, might uh, yeah. might have this as well, but I think American society hmm. um, being a nonconformist is very scary to people. Hmm. Uh, and and I yet think- we have the most famous nonconformists here, right? We've got Thoreau, <laughs> we've got Emerson. Yeah, but you know, I think hmm. that the average person has a hard time with going against hmm. public opinion and hmm. going against the consensus. There's uh, yeah. this this kind of uh, emphasis on uh, popularity, you know, and being uh, being accepted by everyone and not rubbing anyone the wrong way. So, so I, what other countries do you consider the U.S. to be more conformist than? Um, my country, Israel. <laughs> to so you think Israel is is uh, less conformist than the U.S.? I yeah, you know, and are, I, are you like ignoring all the Orthodox? No, no, I would say you, you count the Orthodox. <laughs> I would say I would say authenticity here uh, instead of conformist, but in the you sense aren't there like a lot of people who grow up in Orthodox families who secretly don't like it, but they just feel like they couldn't possibly go against their families. A hundred percent, yes, there there do exist these subcultures, but I but isn't that like but isn't that like a third of the country more? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I don't. Think it's, it's that. What, big what, fra- what fraction of Israel is Orthodox or more that's, than Orthodox? That's a good question. We could look it up. We could look it up. I think um, I like, yeah, well, let's, but I'm like, unless I'm sorely mistaken on the demographics, it's got to be a third, maybe more, maybe a lot more. Yeah, let's, can we look it up now? <laughs> no, we are, we are at 12%. 12% yeah. is uh, orthodox and 10% is ultra orthodox. So, all right, so okay, so all right, 12, 12 and 10. And then, and conser- 10. so then conservative is what? Uh, conservative, no, conservative is not, uh, they're not conformist either. <laughs> they're 33%, but they are okay. very loud and proud. But what, what I'm getting at here is that there's this ability for the individual to just express their opinions, you know, and that might go against their family, might mm-hmm. go against uh, their community. There is this ability and there's, there's this tolerance within the group to, you know, accept different opinions. And and that I think, you know, I've experienced at least growing up in America, uh, people have a hard time being authentic. You know, people talk about just be yourself because, because there is this need for it, right? And I think that, uh, I don't know where it comes from necessarily, uh, but I think that you're pointing to a very big need of, you know, kind of removing ourselves from public consensus, public opinion, and, you know, thinking, what do I feel here? You know, what's my opinion? And can I go against the stream? Uh, and I, th- so what, what do I mean, you think? I'm not much of an American nationalist, but I mean, I've been to a lot of countries. Like, I mean, I actually think of the U.S. as being almost the most nonconformist country that I've ever been to, definitely more than like Canada. And then, you know, like, you know, like Japan, I think they're at close to the peak of conformism. I mean, but yeah. just, you know, like, really like, so like Latin America, yeah, I think of them as more conformist than the U.S. 
let's see, you know, UK, I think, yeah, more so. Like Italy, G- Germany, France, you know, like, like any German speaking country, I think of them as more conformist <laughs> than us. So, you know, like, I mean, like people often think of like Scandinavians, they're more, you know, they're more nonconformist. Like, I haven't been there long enough to really feel confident, but they too seem like they are more. I mean, part of it is that if you, like, Again, like there are definite subcultures of the U.S. that are highly conformist. Like if you hang around at elite U.S. universities, then it's conformist. Yes. But they aren't America. They are one little bit of America. So that that's perhaps, you know, my experience. I grew up in uh, Palo Alto, California. Ah, <laughs> yes. Not really, not, not really America. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. Uh, but although, I do. Although, I mean, just to be in any in any area of tech, there you will see some wild nonconformists uh, because there's just this whole startup mentality and culture, which does get in, uh, interwoven with some really dogmatic political views. But among people that are really entrepreneurial, I I think that the, like, like those people are wild to be around and just to listen to the way their minds think. It's like, wow, you really think outside the box. Yeah, like talking to the Bumble guys, like, wow, all right, this is just a trip just to listen to this guy. There's definitely, you know, more disruptors in the kind of entrepreneurial scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think, you know, that the the political correctness that we see uh, today is very, uh, very much a conformist kind of mm-hmm. mentality. Um, yeah. And I think it's it's subtle in the sense that no, not everybody needs to look the same. Not everybody needs to dress the same. But we do all need to think the same. And, mm-hmm. you know, if there is a certain issue like COVID, like, yeah. uh, you know, a, a certain war going on, everybody. Well, needs- well, think about this. So the U.S. is the is the world center of wokeness, but also the world center of anti-wokeness. COVID, <laughs> we, like, like actually there were U.S. states that stayed almost locked down for a year and more. There were a, there were a bunch of other U.S. states that reopened in a month. So, you, like, you've really got to take the average for the U.S. just to understand yeah. how nonconformist we are. Uh, you say overall, like, it's hard to think of any country I would have rather have been at, uh, you know, been in than the U.S. during COVID because you could at least go to some places where there really were hardly any rules and not only not not only barely any rules but barely any norms. Right, right. No, that is true. That is true. You do have a lot of yeah. I mean, I normally don't sit around waving the U.S. flag and say, "But you're like here." Like, <laughs> so, like, like I, I haven't been to Israel. I'm not like I'm, and it would. I mean, I think it does take a while to really get immersed enough in a culture and get enough of a sampling to get a sense. But still, like ultimately, I do think of the U.S. as the world center of nonconformism. Interesting. So, your opinions, you know, on how uh, the social desire ability bias kind of influences mm. people what where do you see the hurting uh phenomena mm. really take hold of people yeah good question uh so just to back up social desirability bias is the most important idea in psychology that hardly anyone's heard of it's pretty simple it just says when the truth is ugly people lie mm-hmm. and if the lies become ubiquitous enough people stop even thinking about it as lying the most mundane examples are things like, am I fat? There's only one proper answer to that, right? Of course not. You're beautiful just the way you are, Brian. Right now, of course, maybe I am, but there's only one answer that is that people consider to be okay. Uh, there are lots of examples of this. You can see things like people overstate their church attendance. There's whether you ask people, did you go to church? And then we look at real numbers and see it's being overstated. Did you vote? All right. But then there are things you know, like, how much do you give to charity? Uh, but then there are even more mundane examples that we barely even think about. Things like, want to come to my party next weekend? Oh, I can't. It's like, you can't? Will you be in a cage? What do you mean you can't? It's like, I don't want to is the real answer. Um, now, what I, what I say, and I'm actually working on an entire book on this, is that I think this concept actually really helps us to understand the world of politics. It helps us understand why people have so much vocal criticism for markets. If you're an economist, you go to an econ textbook and it says these are the are, are the reasonable complaints about markets, theory of market failure. But you know, and things like, well, there's monopoly, there's asymmetric information, there's externalities. But when you really pay attention to people complaining about markets, they're a lot more likely just to say things like greed, greed. 
And it's like, well, like, why? It's like, greed just sounds bad. Why are you doing it? To make money. You aren't baking bread to help your fellow man. You're doing it to make money. What kind of a monster are you? Like, like a normal person. But uh, yes, you can see that people generally don't like going and avowing these motives. Uh, at the locally, local grocery store chain, Wegmans, there's a big picture of the founder with a big quote when you go into the store. And it says, never think about yourself, always help others. It's like, <laughs> that's what a guy who founded a major chain of grocery stores thinks? That was uh, very Marxist of him. Yes. <laughs> Right. And, you know, the flip side is that people have so much affection for governments that do things like, we'll do whatever it takes regardless of cost. And it's like, regardless of cost, that's crazy. You should care about cost. But it doesn't sound very good to say, we will spend up to $3 million to save the child's life. But if it's more than that, it's just too much. And yeah, well, like eventually there's got to be some amount of money that you won't pay in order to go and save somebody's life. And then why is that the right way? Why is $3 million so horrible once you admit that general principle? It's like, well, we got to go and talk about numbers. But even to say we're considering numbers when these things are, when it, when it concerns life, people get horrified. Hence, we have all these COVID policies of if it saves one life. It's like, look, we could save lives just by saying that no one can ever do anything fun again. And everyone has to stay home unless they're working or shopping. It's like, right. All right. Yeah. But what kind of a life is that? It's trade-off between quality of life and life expectancy. Absolutely. I think this trade-off, uh, you know, wasn't considered. Uh, definitely in places mm -hmm. where the lockdown lasted for yeah. uh, more than, you know, a few single yes. months, uh, it definitely outweighed the hit mm -hmm. that people um, felt, you know, economically, uh, mentally, you know. Uh, yeah. Nothing's more important than safety. <laughs> like, how, how about getting to enjoy anything? <laughs> Isn't that more important than safety? And the risk here was also questionable. So that's also yes. a thing. So right. the safety, the moment, you know, you talk about uh, safety and how how big of a risk is it, people immediately talk about the high risk people, right? Mm -hmm. As kind of to to corner you into a place where, you know, there's, there's no talking rationally about the cost mm -hmm. benefit here. Yes. So, yeah, well, if the high risk people are so worried, shouldn't they isolate? Right? Why should everyone isolate to protect high risk people that don't want to isolate? Seems right, right. Strange. I mean, one of my favorite examples of social desirability bias, at least here in the US, one of the most successful arguments for reopening things was well, we need to reopen gyms because that is important for people's health too. And it's like, like how much life do people get from going to gyms exactly? <laughs> you really think that shutting down the gym for an extra month is going to cost years of life? That's really weird. But this argument worked because at least it's like, well, we're trading off health versus health, so it's complicated. Whereas to say we should reopen bars because people have fun at bars, like we can't go and just risk people's lives for fun. We can only right. risk it for health. We get health for health, we can trade off, but we can't trade off health for fun, even though, of course... People do it with their own lives all the time, and I encourage everyone to keep doing it. This, this again, goes back to the kind of sex education that I had where it's always about, like, like the most important thing is preventing sexually transmitted diseases. And it's like, well, that is a good thing to do. But if, yeah, <laughs> if, you really, if that were the only thing you're worried about, you just tell everybody to be celibate for all their lives, and that would be the end of the problem. But obviously, that is not what people really think, and it is worth some risk in order to go and live a human life. Life is a little bit of a risk. So, you know, if you uh, try to uh, hide yourself and to protect yourself from all risk, yeah. then you're just not living life uh, for sure. And I think a lot of these, you know, public concerns um, can get swept away mm -hmm. into a very, um, you know, overprotective uh, kind of narrative uh, that isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of my, a lot, sort of my biggest complaint about Louise Perry's The Case Against the Sexual Revolution is I think our main social problem right now in relationships is social anxiety, fear of rejection. And I think she's making that worse. Um, You know, I, I think she made some good points. So I do want to, <laughs> to just. Yeah, no, she makes good points. But, but, but the big picture from the book is not, you know, like, 
proactively find love, but rather avoid things that are bad? Well, I'm I'm working on a book right now that talks about how to uh, you know find relationships within the modern culture that we're in. Uh, so yeah, I hope much 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 better. Like, like you know, help people succeed. You know, like like you know, avoiding failure. Sure, that's nice, but I mean, of course, failure is part of the path to success. I'll I will say that I think that her her book is. Um, an important slap in the face for anyone who hasn't considered the downside mm-hmm. of a hookup culture. And once they've kind of uh, swallowed that pill, I think that um, talking about- All right, so first, positive- first they read Louise to get scared <laughs> and then they, read, they, they read, read you to get happy. Hopefully, hopefully that'll be the case. Uh, but I do, I do want to talk about one last topic mm-hmm. uh, in your book. Uh, just uh, I know that I don't have you for uh, too much time. You have this tension in your book between individualism and collectivism, Mm -hmm. uh, which I find very interesting because on the one hand, you're a very individualist thinker and very nonconformist. On the other hand, you really do argue for having children and for Mm -hmm. having that local community of family. Um, And you're, uh, you you know, you criticize Marxism in this book and in other books, uh, rightly so. Uh, But you're also, not for nationalism. So Mm -hmm. where do you see yourself on the scale of individualism and collectivism to start? And then we'll talk about nationalism. Yes. Say, um, of course, the cop-out is it depends on the definition. Like In my mind, I see myself as almost at the individualist pole. You could say, well, a real individualist would have no friends and would just be alone. And I'm like, why would that be? Why couldn't you be an individualist with tons of friends and who really likes being around people? Um, uh, I mean, but also, so like probably like like the best way of thinking about it is, um, see, I'm not sure if it's in in the um, you know in you will not stampede me or in one of my other books. But anyway, you know, I think it actually it, it is in there, and this is one where I talk about. Uh, you know, so I think I have an essay called "The Identity of Shame," where I say, you know, "Don't identify with large, unselective groups." Yes, yes. Right. So I say, it. "Look, it's fine to identify with a small, unselective group like a family, because if it's small, then you're not going to have. You know, at least the odds are you're not going to have some terrible monster in there." And I say, "It's fine to identify with a large but selective group where only people who meet standards get in, but if you identify with a large, unselective group." then you're going to be identifying with a group that just by the numbers is going to have some terrible people doing terrible things. And then you're going to feel like you've got to go and stand up for them. And I say, yeah, like never stand up for bad stuff. You keep your hands clean. So, you know, I, mean, I think the, the ending of the essay says, you know, look, I, you know, I was, you know, I was raised by a you know, Catholic mother, Jewish father, you know, Democrat, you know, Democratic mother, Republican father, you know, like you know, my mom's Irish, my dad's Jewish, like all these groups, just by virtue of having a lot of members have done some really bad stuff. And I say, like, I don't feel bad about it at all because I'm just not with any of those groups. Right? These are they're not they're large, unselective groups, so they're just not part of my identity. So you like identify with you know, family, friends. You know, family's not selective. You take what you get, but so I'll identify with them. They're not, you know, no one in my family's terrible, right? <laughs> um, you know, friends, like, you know, I'll select them. If I had a friend who was a murderer, I would just cut him off. You're not my friend anymore. I'm not friends with murderers. And then I identify with a bunch of ideas. And so the idea is just like, look, you've got to actually be a, you know, a sincere and consistent supporter of these ideas. And then that's part of me. But the other stuff, you know, like, you know, those people, they're not, they're not with me and I'm not going to make apologies for them. Um, and why would I? So a few notes on that. I, I would agree, you know, definitely that the family should be the core unit. Um, above everything else. But I do see in nationalism a really big importance in tying people together around a certain set of values and a, a shared responsibility. Um, because I think the mm-hmm. rights that we have as citizens, you know, and being citizens within a country that comes with, uh, you know, the, the correlating responsibilities. And I think in this world that we live in, which is very multicultural, the only solution to that is 
a strong sense of nationalism. And I think that can coexist with multiculturalism where, you know, you talk about immigration, uh, you have a great uh, graphic novel about mm -hmm. immigration. And I think that not addressing this issue of assimilation, you know, mm -hmm. in celebrating multiculturalism as if it's, you know, diversity is our strength, as people like to say, mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's very difficult to get by when people aren't communicating in the same way and they don't feel that they have a shared responsibility to one another and there isn't some superordinate goal uh, that's tying people together. And I think that is something that uh, is really missed when you don't have a good, healthy sense of nationalism. And nationalism does not have to be fascism, right? It can be the American <laughs> dream. Whew. All right, I was working <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but I think I think in today's world, nationalism is given a very bad name. But, you know, living where I am right now in Israel, uh, and as you said, in large unselective groups, there are members that I disagree with. Our current government is, you know, there are many, many members there uh, who are Israeli and who maybe, you know, an American abroad thinks we're all alike, but you know, who I, uh, I look at our government and I disagree with them. Uh, but I feel that it's my responsibility to, uh, you know, to protest that. And I, ha and I still have responsibility, um, even, even if, uh, you know, outsiders might identify us as the same. And I'll also mention, you know, when the whole, uh, war broke out here, everybody put aside their political differences and banded together. And, mm -hmm. A lot of the manpower, um, besides the military, just the logistical manpower was all volunteer work, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so that sense of nationalism can really move mountains in a very healthy way. And I think that sense of connection and rootedness, if you don't have that, you know, your, your young college students are gonna, um, you know, <laughs> convert to feminism and wokeism and Marxism and uh, all sorts of things. So, hmm. what would you what would you have to say to that? Wow, so much. Yes. Let's see. I think I would just start off by saying so. Like, you know, what's the alternative to nationalism? And like, my view is the alternative is common decency. Is common decency just it's like like you know we're all human beings and like like you know and not my country right or wrong. Like only like my country, if and only if right. I mean, to me, like like if that's if your view is my country, if and only if right, then you're not really a nationalist. The whole idea of nationalism is my country, right or wrong, or at least my country, if right, if kind of right, if moderately wrong. You could be a nationalist, say my country is like totally wrong, then I'll be against it. But that's where I would start. Now, I would just, just step back and say, look, you can go and just make nationalism clean by definition by saying it's only the good kinds that count as true nationalism. But I think that's really cheating and that you've <laughs> got to go and define it more broadly and just say, look, like, is there such a thing as Palestinian nationalism? Like, of course there's Palestinian nationalism, right? And then I mean, you really can look at Palestinian public opinion and see they're getting, you know, they've, their opinion has gotten a lot worse since the war started. Why? Because they're banding together. They're doing this thing that is very human and very and very natural, I think, to human nature, which is in a crisis just to go and support whatever your side is, no matter how bad your side is, which I would consider to be a terrible human trait. Right? I think the, the, the good human trait would be to say, everyone's really upset. Let's calm down and let's figure out whether or not our side is actually in the right or not. And furthermore, it's not binary. It's like, well, our side could basically be in the right, but we could still be doing some terrible things. Uh, our side could basically be wrong, but we make, but we're making some fair points. So these are all the things that I think that a person really should do. Uh, in terms of just thinking of you know, just to praise nationalism in general, I think is almost insane because, look, if nationalism didn't exist, could we really have, even have wars? I think it's almost, it would be almost impossible to have wars without nationalism we because if you, you, know, like you need to have people that are, that are willing to die for their country. You know, like there's this great scene in the movie Patton where Patton says, look, and I don't want to hear any of you saying that, that you're, that you're going to die for your country. No, I don't want to hear you. Like the, the way that you win a war is by getting the other son of a bitch to die for his country. 
right? So that's <laughs> the actual line, which is like the basic point of if not, if both sides were packed with people to say, I'm not going to sacrifice for this, there'd be no war. I wish that were true. <laughs> So the most you might say is nationalism has some value defensively or something like that. But then you are not really praising nationalism per se. You're saying it's something like a prisoner's dilemma. We're in a world where other people are. It's important for you to do it too, um, which is, I think, a very different kind of argument. Uh, and again, just so like I would say that you know the right position is maybe your country is coincidentally in the right, but that's not nationalism. That's having common decency and then applying standards calmly and objectively. Uh, in terms of multiculturalism, you know, my view actually is that's not the real like, you know, multiculturalism is sort of saying like it's great to have lots of different cultures. You know, my view is actually you know what's really great cultural competition, and sometimes some cultures win. Uh, but they don't need to win entirely. There can be competition between multiple cultures and one culture wins culinarily and other cultures win on gender norms. Uh, so like when we talk about Western culture, Westernization, my view is there's cultural competition. And unless there is very powerful government support for keeping out Westernization, Westernization just tends to win because most people actually like it more. There's a reason why uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini said we have to fight against West toxification, which is that Iranians actually will Westernize if they're given a choice, not overnight and not in every way. But there's just something very appealing about Western culture. There's a reason why it spreads. So, you know, I mean, there's people say, well, that's terrible because it's wiping out indigenous cultures, or whatever. And I'll say, well, look, the indigenous culture is so great. Let them compete. Let's see what you have to offer. Um now, like this does not automatically mean that whatever wins is the best culture, but still in terms of what is the best way of thinking about culture, I think to say, look, there's cultural competition and it's best just to see what happens. And usually that turns out to be better is the best approach. Um, and you know, rather than just saying like my culture is the best because it's mine, it's like, well, maybe not. That's true. And I, you know, people do migrate because of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I would yeah, or say- Or they just internally migrate. They start eating KFC in China because the store is <laughs> open. But, but it's not just that. It's also they want to watch Western movies and they want to go and say, hey, like, what about these Western ideas? Uh, why is it we have to go to slave labor camps for thinking about them? It's like, well, the slave labor camps exist because- Without them, a lot of people would, would, would believe the things that you get sent to slave labor camps for. Right. I think that, you know, this idea that cultural competition um, will um, prove that Western ideals are, uh, you know, the best. I, I wish that's what mm -hmm. we'll see um, in the next, uh, you know, century. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think, uh, you know, being uh, located in the Middle East, that mm -hmm. we should not uh, underestimate the mm -hmm. fervor of anti-Western uh, mm -hmm. thought and uh, theocracies uh, and, you know, real mm -hmm. religious fundamentalists that we mm -hmm. in the Western world are not familiar with anymore uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, our religions, be it, you know, Judaism or mm -hmm. Christianity or the multicultural uh, you know, subcultures within America, we we don't see that kind of uh, religious fervor. And I think that if we're talking about the natural selection of cultures, uh, I hope I hope that the the West is going to win in this one. Uh, but that the competition, uh, the the other side might play dirty, uh, to put it uh, plainly. And right. I mean, so you know, like, like so, like I mean. I, mean, I actually I know a lot about totalitarian cultures, including totalitarian theocracies. I've spent years reading about them. I mean, again, like my point is that even in countries that you think of as horrible theocracies, they contain a lot of people that don't want this stuff. I mean, first Absolutely. of all, they contain people that would love to get out to almost any other country that would take them. But secondly, even within the countries, there's just a lot of demand for Westernization, which is why they're so repressive, actually. You know, right. like, you know, if you know, if there were just no one in Saudi that wanted to be Western, they wouldn't they would be bothering with the religious police. The reason they're doing it is because they realize there's a lot of dissent. A lot of people don't buy the whole package. Same thing in Iran. 
Um, so like, and then it's like, well, then why do they win? And the answer is that the totalitarians are just, they're a small minority, but they're much more fanatical. They're, they're, they are much more willing to die and to murder for their ideas. It does not mean that the people themselves are totally committed, uh, you know, which again, you can just see when you go and ask for volunteers for suicide missions, like you can get them, but it's a tiny minority of the people that actually officially believe that this would be a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, so like, you know, in the Iran Iraq war, you got to conscript people to go and be human fodder. They're not actually lining up by the millions. It's more like maybe a few hundred will line up. Unfortunately, those few hundred really punch above weight in terms of outcomes because they are so vicious and so willing to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, so I mean, this is really the whole story of ISIS. There actually was opinion polling of ISIS all over the Middle East. Almost everyone hated them. But if it were not for Western intervention, they probably would now be ruling two major countries, actually, because that small number of guys just wanted it a lot more. Yeah. Uh, which is. First of all, it's a good thing to know, but on the other hand, it is just totally wrong to think that a majority of the population of Syria and Iraq loved ISIS. They didn't. They hated them. Right. I do think that this is, first of all, true. But on the other hand, the radical minority mm -hmm. is very problematic and it shouldn't yes. be disregarded just mm -hmm. because it's a minority. No, no, no. Like never, don't disregard <laughs> anything. Regard all facts. It's always important to regard facts. Yes. But also just keep it in mind. It's like, you know, like our suicide bombers, are they like typical Muslims? They are just not. Like, and you might say, like, don't be naive, Brian. Like, I'm not being naive. Like, I'm happy to say that you've got 0.01% are ready to die. But that's really different from saying half or a two thirds are ready to die. That's just not true. And then the optimal strategy of dealing with the situation really depends on if it's a small number of people or if it's most people. Yeah, if it's most people, then I can totally understand why people would be terrified of Muslim immigration. It's a really tiny minority, then it's like, all right, well, let's keep our eyes peeled. But let's not go and say that millions of people are right on, on the edge of mass murder when they're just not. The I think the statistics are 25% are radical, uh, which is a pretty big minority. Well, so uh, there's vocally, <laughs> there, there's like a, a say radical on a survey versus a ready to strap on a vest. Those are really different things, as it turns out. Um, yes, but yes. they're very quick to heat up. <laughs> yes, you know from personal experience. So, yes. oh, yeah. so we like and, you know, ready to vote? Then yeah, totally. But you know, like even within Israel, so you've got your Arab minority of about twenty percent of the population, right? And so out of them, there's been a very small number involved in suicide attacks. But if you just think about them compared to their probably close blood relatives over in Gaza, on the westernization spectrum, they are way, way over at your end, despite the fact that they are not the same as Israelis. Right. You know, there are a lot of uh, Arab Israelis uh, speaking out now about, you know, the lives that they can get to lead mm -hmm. here, uh, you know, which wouldn't be yeah. the case uh, in Gaza yeah. or the West Bank. Um, yeah. But Right. And, you know, like it's, it's very easy to be pessimistic when you see, hey, they sympathize with the Palestinians more with it, more, more than Israel. And, and, and there are those on cases. The, on the other hand, to say, well, if you just put them on a spectrum, put them on a spectrum from zero to 100, if you put the leaders of Hamas at zero and put the you know, put Netanyahu at 100, and then where are Israeli, uh, Israeli Arabs? Right. Maybe they're at 70. All right. And it's like, well, I want them further. Right. But they're not at zero. Right. Right. You know, they're the, the last point I'll make about nationalism, um, which I think is an important one when we consider the multiculturalism that we live in, you know, and the and the utility of nationalism in this case. Uh, we have uh, the Druze uh, mm -hmm. Arabs, if, if you're mm -hmm. familiar. Oh, so, yeah. Well, they're not really Arabs, are they? Um, I mean, they're their own thing, aren't they? They're they're their own thing, but they're. I, I think they, do they would, even speak. Do they speak? Is Arabic their first language? Or I, I believe so. Okay. I, so all right, I'm fine. Not gonna. I'm not gonna. Yes. You know, uh, put okay. it in stone. But I, I do yeah. believe. so. I know a lot about Druze for an American, but yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think that they have their own faith. Yes. Um, I will say that. Yes. Yeah, so definitely, they're not Muslim. 
But yeah. Uh, yeah, their, their their main figure in the religion is Moses's father-in-law, if I recall correctly. Is that so? I, did, yes, I didn't know that. That's the big guy. Okay. <laughs> but one of the things that is really beautiful about them is that they feel very much connected to Israel. They feel Israeli. They well, feel the Israeli like Druze, Israel. but the like, you know, like the, the Druze in other countries are really into that country. So they're 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 they big into assimilating like- to whatever country they're in, from what I understand. Exactly. They have this, um, you know, kind of feature, uh, mm-hmm. if you will, in their culture of, of assimilating to the country that they live in. And I think when we talk about whether it's immigration, you know, whether it's uh, diversity mm-hmm. and multiculturalism, the assimilating into a higher order uh, set of values and culture uh, under uh, this, you know, banner of nationalism, I think that's a healthy thing for society. You know, I think it's a healthy mm-hmm thing for, for, for societies to function and for people to function together. And I think a society can tolerate more multiculturalism when it doesn't apologize for its nationalism, when it doesn't apologize for the set of values that make up uh, th- that certain country, um, you know, the, the values and the culture and the, the personality of that country. All right, let me, let me put it this way. I'm going to go and give you a list of countries, and then I want you to tell me whether you wish that they had less nationalism. All right, Palestine. <laughs> you, wish they, I assume, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you wish they had less nationalism, right? All right, yeah. Egypt. I don't think I- Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi. All right, just go down the you know, like Sudan, Turkey. Like, like, like you wish all these countries had less nationalism, don't you? And it would obviously be much better. I wouldn't say nationalism. So, you know, like, you know, like why say why why even say the word is I'm in favor of nationalism? Why not just say I'm in favor of Israelism? And that's it. Now, like nationalism in general, no, it's terrible. But there's you know, like there's a few good countries. They've got something to offer. Everybody else should calm down and realize and take a I good look think, at the error. I don't think nationalism is the problem here. You know, it's the um, first. It's not of the all, problem in all those countries I named. I don't think it's nationalism. No, I think it's a theocracy. You know, I think it's it's um, extremism, uh, but I wouldn't say nationalism is the root of all evil here. And, you know, to, to uh, make a I point. Mean, about- isn't it just sort of no through Scotsman and you're just not going to define it? I mean, just think about it this way. So, like, you know, a common story I've heard from Israelis is there isn't even really any such thing as a Palestinian. It's an invented group. Like, like, and like, like So they should just forget about it. And when I hear that, I'm like, yeah, man, totally. It'd be great if they just forgot about it. Like, wouldn't it be better if they just didn't have that identity at all and they just didn't care? I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is <laughs> well, that- you're, Yeah, they, you're not. You're like, no, wouldn't it be better no, no, if they just no, forgot? You don't want them to forget about it. I If they wouldn't have forgotten about it and they would have been able to coexist with us, they have gotten multiple deals of having their own state. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, like, want- yeah, but, but like, what, like, you know, like, here's your choice. Do you either give them amnesia about being Palestinian or not? Do you give no. them amnesia? Why not? No, no, no. Like, there'd be peace. Like, totally be peace. There wouldn't be peace. There wouldn't be if they peace. had amnesia about amnesia. being Palestinians, amnesia. they wouldn't even know what they're fighting about anymore. They'd be like, whatever. Na- nationalism isn't the issue here. The issue is that they don't want Jews around. The fact that if they had a healthy sense of nationalism and just wanted a state and to live side by side to another Jewish state, we wouldn't have had an issue. But this is deep anti-Semitism. That's not nationalism. That th- those are two different things. Well, I agree they're two different things. But yeah, like like a lot of their problem is that they are really angry about all the bad things that Israel has ever done to them, and they feel no guilt about all the bad things they've ever done to Jews, which is standard nationalism. My country, right or wrong, the stuff that my country does is always fine, and, and any small harm to my country from another one is terrible and must be avenged. Um, I mean, let me, let me do this way. So, like, what does nationalism mean if not, you know, leaning towards my country, right or wrong? If it's my country, if and only if right, that's not nationalism, is it? It's a sense of responsibility as a citizen and understanding that the rights that the country gives you are, you know, your have a responsibility as well and that you, um, you know, subscribe to. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. But, but you're, 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 Brett Brani, you're dodging the question. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, my country right, my my country right or wrong. If you don't have, if you have, if you just say no way, no resp- no sympathy for that, you're not a nationalist. You know, like like a key, like really central to nationalism is at least rounding error in favor of your country, 
And if you got two countries in conflict and they both round in their favor, then you got conflict. Yeah, but that's not nationalism. That's human nature. <laughs> that's- yeah, well, actually, I'll say, uh, well, here's the thing, like, it is like it. It is you know, like it's not human nature to care about this large group. Actually, it's really surprising that human beings are capable of that. For most of human history, it didn't exist. People only identified with their band and didn't care about other people that were even you know, ten miles down the road. Sort of the amazing thing in the modern world is we've been able to get people to feel like their tribe is millions of people. But that requires a lot of work, actually, to indoctrinate people into that. Um, but you know, like I mean, you can even put it down at the level of, of the of the tribe. Like you know, so like my you know, my tribe, right or wrong. I mean, and by the way, you're mentioning the the family being this most basic level. I mean, what's really cool about the family as a level of identity is that people are actually fairly reasonable about family compared to how they are about the nation. Like we actually do condemn a parent that is biased in judging a kid's sporting event because his kid's on one team. Right, we condemn a parent that stands up for his kid when the kid is the bully. Right, and like most parents actually say, like if their kid's in a fight, they'll they'll say who started it, not my kid, right or wrong. Right, that's common decency. I mean, it's amazing to me that this very fundamental evolved group identity actually is so tempered with a sense of right and wrong. And I think it'd be great if countries could have even a share of that to think that maybe our country has done something bad and the other side has a point. I think that, you know, to, to start with the idea of family as this kind of buffer uh, for potential insanities that might uh, crop up in a certain culture, uh, you know, a, a, a national culture, I think it is helpful to have the family as that, you know, basic social unit. Uh, if your kid is going to school and they're being taught, you know, all of this woke nonsense, uh, it's helpful to have a strong family unit to buffer mm-hmm. them from those ideas. But I would say, you know, and, 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 and this is the difference between, I believe, nationalism and uh, extremism or nationalism and totalitarianism, having a sense of group identity, of connection, of responsibility to your country and being able to criticize your country in a rational manner when you don't agree with the, you know, overarching policies that happens within nationalism. You know, there are, there are ebbs mm-hmm. and flows of who's in government, and uh, yeah, you know, sure. There's there's always the I'm the true patriot because I'm willing to say that we're making a mistake because I really love my country. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 it's it's to- totally a thing, but you know, my country, right or wrong, that I think really is the core of nationalism, which again does not mean my country no matter what, but at least. I'm going to always err in favor of my country. This is actually like you know, one of the best examples of this. Uh, the U.S. shot down a commercial Iranian plane, and uh, there, then there was you know decades of negotiation. I mean, at least there was a long negotiation about what you know, about resolving the issue, and Iran won an apology. And the first George Bush just said, "I won't apologize. I'm not an apologize for America kind of guy." Like, you're crazy! Like you shot down in like an innocent civilian plane. To pol- like just say I'm sorry. Like come on. Right, right. No, I mean these things are are uh, complex, you know. But you know the the last uh, last point that I uh, I thought of when you were speaking was that nationalism is the root to all wars, and I think that's also a problematic stance because. You know, and this goes. Do you back agree to, that, that, that as I'm defining it, I'm right? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, what? no, no, no. I'm definitely <laughs> as I define it, I'm definitely right. I, like, I you, don't know. You get a war when there's two sides where they both overestimate how much in the right they are. I think that this this is deeper. You know, I think this is very biological. I think this is part of human nature. I think that you know, have you seen the new um, chimpanzee uh, documentary uh, where it shows you know this mm-hmm. very primal uh, instinct of bands of chimps, uh, mm-hmm. you know, banding together, doing their boundary patrols. And this is something that Jane Goodall mm-hmm. uh, discovered, you know, mm-hmm. in the sixties, but this idea that our closest ancestors have this deep instinct of, you know, conducting warfare against another yeah. tribe of their species, mm-hmm. 
that's built into us. And the fact that we've been able to socialize ourselves out of that and to tolerate multiculturalism and to tolerate people of different races and cultures and uh, ideas is beautiful and, and it's important. But knowing that we do have this biological instinct uh, and, and understanding that if it pops up, you know, something in our systems maybe isn't doing a good job of restraining it. But I wouldn't say nationalism is the cause. You know, extreme senses of right and wrong are definitely problematic. Uh, but I would urge you to consider that there are certain beauties in nationalism as well. <laughs> I mean, the chimps, I don't know. That seems exactly like what I'm talking about. But here, let me, let me finish with this. Yeah. All right. So you got a bunch of kids that are being indoctrinated with woke stuff. And you got two choices. One is you can say, look, you're all we're all Americans. That's the nationalist answer to wokeism. Here's the other one. We're all human beings. That is the one that I think is the better one. So like stop thinking about yourself as being of a certain race Oh, you know, of being of, a, of being of a certain gender, of being of a of us being of a certain ethnicity, of being a certain identity, but then say like we're all Americans. Like, well, so then like we should be banding together to go and blame things on people aren't Americans. Like, no, like we're all human beings. Focus on our commonalities, not our differences, and especially focus on being a decent human being first and foremost controlling your instinct to go and favor people that are of, or that are of any group that you belong to and just try to be de a decent human being to everyone, right? You know, like you might say we're chimps. We're not, it's not going to happen. It's still the best thing to be <laughs> telling people to do. I agree. I agree. I think um, you uh, assume uh, the best in people, which is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, I, know. I, like, like, I, I see the horribleness of people. <laughs> Never say that I see the best in people. <laughs> no, uh, like I see all kinds of horrible stuff. I read history. I know how terrible people are. I was just at Auschwitz. Like I know yeah. how awful human beings can be. But yeah. in terms of telling them what they should be, like let's let's set the the, the goalposts far and do our best. I agree. I agree. And I think that's an important message. And I think common decency is something we should strive for, um, most certainly. Uh, so I do appreciate that message. Thank you, Brian. This has right, been thank you. very fun, right. very engaging. It's been, been super fun. So, Brian, can you tell everyone where they can find your work? All of my books are available on Amazon. Let's see. I assume there's Amazon.il for your Israeli viewers. It is Amazon.il, right? Um, perhaps, but just oh, well, so, Amazon. Uh, so, is, <laughs> so there, there is no, there is no Amazon in Israel. So you know, wherever no, there you get, is, there is, but it's okay. Amazon.co.il. But they'll ah, find it. Don't worry, don't course, worry, Brian. Of course. All right, and then I blog on Substack for Bet on It, which now has twenty years worth of my archives. So if you want to hear almost anything I've said about anything, go there and take a look. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Check check his work out. It's brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Great pleasure talking to you, Ronnie. You too.